Scrutiny Committee, uh, which is taking place in the Spark and Ho Committee Room here at County Hall uh, in Glenfield. Um, some of the officers will be joining uh, via Microsoft Teams. Um, others hopefully will be joining us in the room. Uh, this meeting is being webcast live to the public on YouTube. So please uh, turn uh, your microphones on uh, when you're speaking, but otherwise please leave them off. Um, we have one substitute today, uh, Mr. Ross Hills, uh, and who's replacing uh, Mr. Phil King. So welcome, Ross. And uh, otherwise, we're all here. So um, welcome to the other uh, committee members. And uh, we're going to start with um, agenda item one, which is the minutes of the meeting held on the 19th of January 2022. Uh, so I propose that the minutes of the meeting uh, held on the uh, 19th of January uh, are taken as read, confirmed and signed. Is everyone happy with that? Agreed? OK, thank you very much. So we now move on to item two, which is question time. We have received no questions uh, from the public. So that means it's item three, which is questions asked by members understanding order seven slash three and seven slash five. Uh, so we have received two questions from Mrs. Hack in relation to ambulances. Uh, Mrs. Hack has been provided with written answers to the questions and the answers have been published on the uh, County Council's website. Uh, so Mrs. Hack, um, are there any other further questions that you wish to ask any supplementary questions relating to the uh, questions that you asked? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, the information that was provided by the response was really useful. Um, I was just really interested to understand the difference between the average performance for ambulance waiting time being just over an hour, and then the pathway that's mentioned in the question, which uh, is called the Healthcare Professional Conveyancing Protocol, nice and snappy title, um, is, is actually, it's almost like a planned process for getting to hospital by ambulance. That average wait is one hour and 53 minutes. It was just a query about why such a difference? What work has been done to try and address that? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you very much. Um, I think what we'll do is actually take that question and, and come back to you in that case with a, uh, an additional answer, uh, if that's OK. OK, thank you. So um, uh, we move on in that case to item four, which is the advice of any other items which uh, I've decided to take as urgent. There are no items. So uh, we now move on to uh, item five, which is declarations of interest in respective items on the agenda. So can I ask uh, Mr Smith, you raise your arm. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. I've got a, a personal interest in item number nine as I work in the health and fitness sector, especially with young children. OK, thank you very much. Are there any other items that anyone wishes to Mr Hills? I have to declare and just work as a dentist for the NHS. Um, we're going to be debating oral health coming up. Brilliant. Excellent. It's always handy to have somebody who actually knows something about health on the committee, so thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, any other declarations? No, nope. looking around the room, absolutely none, so that's great. Thank you very much for those two. Uh, you and are you happy with, with those two? Yep, good. So, um, we now move on to item six, declarations of party whip in accordance with the overview and scrutiny procedure 16, and there are no, um, well, I, I'm going to ask, are there any declarations of whip need to be asked? I don't think there are. Nope. Okay, so... Uh, moving on in that case to item seven, presentation of petitions under standing order 35. Uh, there are no new petitions uh, this week. However, that leads us on to item eight, uh, which in relation to a petition that was uh, received uh, last meeting. Uh, this is item uh, eight in relation to the Lovers Thorpe and Forest House Medical uh, Centre development. Um, uh, this uh, arose, as I said, because of the petition that was um, uh, submitted by uh, Mrs Hack. Um, uh, and it's to presented a, a report uh, we have uh, from Sarah Shuttlewood, his assistant director um, uh, for contracts and procurement at Leicester City uh, CCG, and also taking part in the meeting are uh, Andy Williams, who I think is uh, online, is the chief executive uh, at uh, LOI CCGs, and Richard Morris, director of operations and corporate affairs at Leicester City CCG. Uh, so welcome to you. Um, all three of you. Um, I also have online uh, Councillor uh, Bob Watson. Uh, are you there, Bob? You're, you're, yes, you're on my screen. Excellent. Uh, you're um, uh, Councillor at uh, Braunston Town Council. Um, and uh, if it's okay, uh, Bob, I've um, 
Uh, I'm going to give you an opportunity to ask a couple of uh, opening questions, and then what we'll do is is um, I'm going to ask Mrs. Hack to uh, follow on with a question, and then we'll open up uh, with any other questions of the committee. So, Bob, um, I'm going to pass over to you for uh, uh, a couple of questions from you to start off with. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Uh, <clears throat> hopefully you can hear me because I've um, switched the mic going on. Um, OK, I wanted to, first of all, focus on the, um, if you like, the feelings of the people in the area. Um, we ha we do have uh, some documents, of course, which uh, are part of this uh, presentation now. Um, as I understand it, there, there hasn't been a survey by the Clinical Commissioning Group um, and what the documents rely on is the work done uh, by Forest House. Um, we found, and I don't think I'm exaggerating this, to say that that uh, investigation of, of people's feelings was deeply flawed um, because we went, we were on the doorstep and Many of the people we spoke to hadn't received the paper document for them to respond. And quite a lot of people, of course, uh, being elderly, didn't have internet access. And as your documents show, the actual survey done by Forest House hardly gave overwhelming support uh, for the proposed move. So the reliance on that work, uh, I don't think is satisfactory, um, but there's no recognition in your reply uh, to the, uh, no recognition of the petition. I mean, what we're looking at here is 1,300 plus people who um, uh, opposed uh, the move, opposed the move of, of Forest House Medical Centre from its current location on Bronson Crossroads. Now, this is this is a face-to-face -face survey. We're not talking about people having a piece of paper or not having a piece of paper. This is actually talking to people on the doorstep. Um, uh, having the opportunity to sign the petition was greatly welcomed by the people who signed, um, and there's hardly anyone refused to sign. So you're looking at 1,300 plus, and it could be greater because, you know, time did not permit us to go further into the catchment area. But this is 1,300 then. And it revealed, amongst other things, a large number of people who consider themselves to be disadvantaged by uh, the move, particularly the elderly. They weren't elderly when they moved to the area, but have become so, can't drive now, and so on, and disabled people uh, having similar difficulties. So my question, this first question, sorry about the long ramble at the beginning, but it's important to understand what we're looking at here. You now have the opportunity, the Clinical Commissioning Group now has the opportunity to respond to the petitioners. So the question really is, what do you have to say to them uh, when they've said they don't want this move to take place? OK, thank you, uh, Bob. Can I ask uh, whether Sarah, Andy or Richard would um, wish to um, recap on that? Um, we do recognize. Oh, do you want to go? Oh, yes. I think we're all waiting for each other to speak, aren't we? I uh, apologies. This is the limitation of being in a, a different place. I was going to suggest that that um, we we with regard to the questions, it might be helpful if we held them and then work through the paper because I think that describes um, the process and position that we went through. But the CCG's responsibilities and obligations in respect of primary care and the duties of the practice in respect of consultation might need to just be explained a little. So um, I, I'm not trying to be evasive. I'm really happy to come back and answer that question. And I certainly take very seriously the, the issue of the petition. It's evident there's a very strong groundswell of opinion, which we can't ignore here. But I just want to chair whether it would be better to lodge the questions, take the report and then have the discussion I'm following that, if that were possible. 
Okay, uh, thank you, Andy. Uh, yeah, no, that's absolutely fine. Let's let's take um, maybe uh, all the questions from Bob, and we'll also follow up with um, Amanda's, and then uh, if you can actually respond to to those questions, yep. and then if there are other points that Amanda uh, and others wish to pick up from the committee, then uh, we can do after the presentation. So, uh, Bob, uh, is there another question that you want to ask as well, and then we'll take that, and I said we'll go to yeah. Amanda then, and then we'll come back to hmm. Andy and his team. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, I have in front of me your mission statement, the Clinical Commissioning Group's mission statement. Um, and what it says is uh, to improve health by meeting our patients' needs with high quality and efficient services led by clinicians and delivered closer to home. Now, provision goes through. Uh, that's to say the, the move of the Forest House goes through. What thought's been given to replacing it because unless it's replaced there will be a large gap in healthcare provision for a lot of people um, in that area so it, it's it's looking ahead if forest house move what thoughts being given to a replacement thank you chair amanda do you want to come in next yeah sure thank you thank you chair um i, I mean i think I think one of the things that was frustrating for me is all of the information that's in this paper. I've already seen in the public domain. There was nothing new. There was not an actual response to the people that had that signed the petition. There wasn't a, a recognition of that. I think one of the frustrations I've had all the way along, though, has been that the practice and the CCG know the patient profile that will be impacted by the move. The data is available to you. And yet, essentially what happened when the consultation took place, there was no postcode element taken as part of that consultation. So you didn't actually know where the responses were coming from. So, of course, if you live right next to Warren Lane or you live on Tay Road in Lubberstorp, it doesn't affect you. You're going to be happy with new services. But the, you know, the, the area that, that I represent and, and just over the way in, in Leicester Forest East and, and in part the north part of Thorpe Astley, um, the, the, the actual um, impact on those individuals can be identified because you know what the patient profile is. And there's, look, it doesn't look to me as if the impact assessment has followed what, does the, what, the, what the patients need. I suppose that the second the second thing probably following on from from Bob really is is about access and I and I will share with you um I've had loads of conversations on the doorstep. We've gone door to door, but as you obviously are the as the local county council representative, people have contacted me. You know, I I've had plenty of phone calls, and I, I'll recall so it's not somebody who lives in my division. Actually, lives just over the Leicester Forest East. She's eighty five and struggles to walk to park drive as it is. She cannot get public transport, which is just up the road, park drive, and then there's a bus stop. She can't manage the public transport because actually where the bus drops you off on the Hinkley Road, it's slightly uphill to Warren Lane and then slightly downhill back to the bus stop. She cannot manage it. For her, it's 11 quid in a taxi. And she's now starting to worry at 85 years of age that she can't afford to access the GP. And I think that for me is where we've, we've, what we've done is we've looked at a consultation that's been very much about what's in the best interest of the practice. This is great. We're going to have a new shiny building in Lubberstock. And I really want new facilities and new areas. That's not what this is about. It's about making sure that provision of communities that are already established doesn't get overlooked and at the moment, there's nothing in the papers presented that recognises the petitions even taken place other than the summary. There's no response to the, to the individuals that have signed that petition. And those people are in really, really worried about loss of provision. I do also think, if I may, sorry, Chair, I think it's really frustrating to see in the paperwork the use that Park Drive went down to a red site during covid as being it's not a, a facility that's used by the public or valued by the public. The commercial operator made the decision 
to change the way the practice was run during COVID. And I don't think it, that's a fair assessment of what is available and what should be available to that community in normal times. And I, and I actually think that undertaking the consultation with that in place is incredibly unfair to the community and does a disservice to the service provision that is normally actively available. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you very much. Um, so, Andy, do you want to come back? Uh, you and your team come back now and then if there are <clears> any other points, then we the committee can pick those up um, after you've made your response. Yeah, thank you. And uh, so this is a really difficult situation because obviously there's a considerable growth uh, in the population in the area and the practice are thinking about how they respond to that by trying to uh, look for a way of meeting an expanded service provision and trying to work out how best to to respond to that. Um, uh, we can, and I will invite Sarah in a moment just to run through the report and the process that was undertaken, but I think the essence of this dilemma is um, does the practice relocate? And I feel the answer to that is yes, it should, because it's clearly going to need to operate out of a of a larger premise to meet what's already a growing population and is set to grow further again. And that then raises the issue about whether there's a satellite uh, premise. And I think it might be worth us just touching on on uh, on uh, issues around that. But um, let me invite Sarah to run through the paper and then I'd like to kind of just circle back to um, what, if any, options we may have to explore um, uh, beyond that. So um, perhaps, Sarah, I could bring you in at this stage. Yes, thank you. Um, so I think I'd like to start by saying that this development and the consideration of the Lubbersort development, what might be needed in that particular vicinity, actually started in 2011 when the development was first um, considered. And so this has been given an awful lot of thought. In 2018, we uh, it was presented to the East Leicester Chair Rutland's um, CCG to consider uh, potential options for how we can balance the needs of, of all the individuals in that particular area. And, and as Andy said, the growing population is significant. And we appreciate that you that you understand that. Um, so we've worked quite closely with the practice to ensure that the engagement and consultation has been undertaken appropriately and reasonably. Um, so in terms of, I mean, the report sets it out that there has been uh, an engagement process. The, 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 uh, the practice has tried to, to use a number of, of uh, for us to engage with people, you know, mail, social media, site visits etc when people attend attend the actual site um, and they were particularly keen to get a variety of, of views from um, from the population it is obviously difficult to get um, a, a, a significant um, response rate across all of the of the population that we're, we're we're dealing with but it was quite a, a, a robust response rate um, you know, a lot of the, the lot of the issues that have been raised were considered and taken on board through that through the the engagement and the consultation, um, uh, the consultation activities between August 21 and September 21 were have been set out and the the additional things that were undertaken as part of of that on top of the engagement. I think 48% uh, of people that respondents were in favour of the proposal is is significant. And um, there was also a, a, there is a recognition that, you know, it, we it's not going to meet everybody's needs and we need to think about how we can address some of the, the people that will be challenged. Hence why the practice who are responsible and have the legal obligation to undertake the consultation have set up um, an implementation group to to really consider the individuals, the people that you've just described, Councillor Hack, who will be challenged to, to perhaps attend the, the Lubbers local, um, new local facility. There are different options. It won't just be about public uh, public transport. We have voluntary, uh, voluntary uh, car 
provision that could support individuals as well. So all of these issues will be reviewed and mitigated when the new build is, is actually in place. And we'll continue to work with the local authority around, around the public transport. It is, it is a... I think, as Andy said, it is a balance, it is a, it is a challenge because, um, you know, we do need, we do need to have uh, new developed facilities where people can get a much greater uh, access to healthcare and a range of healthcare services, more local to where they live. Um, and that's, I guess, where, you know, that one stop concept, that one stop shop concept where people can attend and, and, and see a range of healthcare professionals. And we did look, we've done quite a bit of, we've scrutinised quite a bit the, the challenge around the workforce constraints and the economic constraints if we were to keep three sites. You know, we recognise for many years, Forest, Forest House, that location has always been um, uh, not an ideal location for a health, a, a, a new developed healthcare facility, and I think in this day and age we would be looking for more modern facilities than that. So with all of that weighed up, you know the the consultation that the the practice undertake undertook, and then the the presentation to the committee, all of that weighing up, we felt that the process had been robust, and the outcome was that we needed to work with the local communities and stakeholders to work through how we could resolve some of the challenges that that may present to local people. Okay, thank you very much. If I can just come back with a concluding thought, thank you. And um, this issue of care closer to home is really important, and I can understand immediately the point uh, uh, the councillor was making about this seeming completely at odds with that mission statement because it obviously makes more distant access for um, uh, people in parts of this community. But just to unpack that a little, the, the concept of care closer to home is really about trying to get more care delivered in outside of an acute hospital setting and key to doing that is to have uh, 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 robust modern facilities that are capable of housing not just GPs but a whole multidisciplinary team and the infrastructure. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there I'm really happy to have a kind of a you know open it up for a wider conversation and, and to be open to suggestions uh, and, and challenge as well of course. Okay, thank you very much, Andy. Um, so my only, my only comment, probably from reading the report, for somebody who's who's uh, not really um, particularly au fait with with the location of the um, proposed, the existing, and the uh, temporary um, uh, facilities, uh, not being a Blaby uh, member, uh, we, obviously Amanda uh, is a Blaby member. Uh, Mrs. Richardson, who's actually on the call, who's obviously our lead member. Uh, at the county council, I know you're also a Blaby member, but um, for for the rest of us, actually not having a map actually is quite difficult to really get our heads around uh, what this may be for general sort of uh, discussion. So I don't know whether uh, Mrs. Hank, you you want to sort of come back with some of those points, um, and then we'll see if anyone else um, has anything to say. Thank you. I think I think what's really difficult with this, and and, and I don't know whether or not colleagues in the room will be aware. But obviously, um, the history and the residents tell you the history because the residents know it better than I do. Um, Park Drive has obviously been established for many, many years and Warren Lane got itself into a bit of bother. And the Park Drive partners helped Warren Lane practice. And now it feels like, and this is certainly what's coming across from the residents, that now we've helped Warren, Warren Lane to become re-established they're now going to shut us. And that's how local people feel. I think that the, the impact of removing this is a real problematic. You know, Sarah, you talked about access. That's the crux of it, really. The particular group of residents that I serve, this particular part of my patch, does have older people in there, people mm -hmm. with dis greater disabilities. We, we have um, sheltered accommodation just literally we, right on the edge of the catchment. Um, we have a quite a considerable um, sheltered accommodation just around the corner. Um, and I think that the impact on an older population is going to feel greater than, than, than maybe, a, a, you know, a, a new community like Lubbersalt where, where I live. And I think this is where we can't square the circle is that we talk about access 
and Lubberstorp being will be, and I'm I'm sure it'll be absolutely amazing. I was involved in the Bronson New Deal, uh, the New Deal, so Bronson Health and Social Care Centre. I've seen that developed out the ground, so I know what's what's possible. But actually, if you can't physically access it, it doesn't matter how possible it is. You're still that barrier is still there, and I think this is the real concern we've got within the community is. The facilities that will be replaced, I'm so thrilled that Lubberstorp is going to have that. I, I have no problem with that whatsoever. It's the impact on the residents that already live in the community, which are going to feel it the hardest. And I don't think from anything that's been said so far, that those individual groups of residents have been considered quite as detailed as much as the commercial operator would, would make us feel. Because consultation was five questions they didn't ask the postcode so if you actually live on at the it says in the paper it's a one and a half mile from from um, park drive to to warren lane it is it's not far i run it every every week i know how far it is but actually if you live right on the edge of the catchment it's three miles to get to warren lane and it's two buses to get to warren lane mm. and the bus mitigation the transport mitigation for lubberstorp is for people who live in Lubberstorp. It's not for anybody else. So Bronson Town residents get excluded from um, introductory rates, better rates on a reader click, for example. But actually, most of these people don't have a smartphone because they can't access a reader click anyway. So there's lots of issues here, and I I'm really concerned by the way within which the, the consultation was done. It didn't actually make inclusivity part of it. It didn't ask you where you lived. Yeah. Didn't ask you how regularly you visited the GP, and also once you put a barrier in place for an older person, and the lady who was eighty-five spoke to me, went, "I just won't be able to get to the GP anymore." That actually broke my heart. Speaking to her, she was in tears. You could hear the voice, and this is it repeated over and over again on the doorstep. So once you take services away, they never come back, and that's what the residents are really worried about. But they feel that they've been abandoned and that isn't going to go away. And I think we really do need to have a proper serious conversation about what needs to happen for this community to feel engaged again in the process. OK, OK. I can see um, Councillor Watson's got his hand raised as well, isn't he, sir? Oh, thank you. Um, uh, just to add to that, of course, that in asking people who previously could go to the Bronson Crossroads um, surgery to go to Warren Lane is not the same thing um, in terms of provision as asking them to go to New Lubberstock, which is even more difficult, of course, but um, because Warren Lane is really just a posh version of what used to be, you know, with a few additions of what used to be. <laughs> Uh, provided a, a, a Bronson Crossroads. So I'm I'm a patient with the surgery. I'll probably be excommunicated uh, eventually. But um, but uh, but um, it isn't. I mean, it, you know, it may if everybody could go to New Lovers Thorpe with the with no Forest House wonderfully and easily, that would be wonderful. But that is not the case. And going to Warren Lane is difficult, as Councillor Hack has just uh, explained and doesn't offer the facilities that New Lovers Thorpe does. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, look, we've got one more question um, from uh, Stuart, Stuart Bray, uh, and then, uh, Andy, if I can ask you just to... Yeah. I think this is about listening and, and uh, some of the points, obviously, that Amanda's raised about uh, the questionnaire, etc. cetera, um, I think are, are a good point. But um, I think this is probably... Uh, there isn't going to be a conclusion from this meeting, I suspect, but... Um, mm. Uh, yeah. It's worth uh, hearing the points and uh, maybe taking up the points afterwards as well. So over to you, Stuart. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Just very briefly, it's picking up on your point actually that obviously this this doesn't impact on on my residents and my constituents, but I know I know roughly where we're talking about. But I suspect with with the pressures that all of us are under to accept growth, I suspect this won't be the only time this happens in coming years. And my my concern is obviously to to, to listen to what Amanda has had to say about the experiences that her constituents have suffered, but also to make sure that we learn some lessons from this going forward. Indeed. Um, 
Absolutely. So, uh, Andy, can I can I go back to you? Final comments. Yeah. Um, but but this is about, as, as Stuart has rightly said, picking up on the points that Amanda and others have raised um, about process and making sure um, that uh, we're, we're very very thorough about um, uh, the consultation process in particular. Okay. Thank you. Well, um, I think. Uh, um, I mean, there's clearly a lot of food for thought. The strength of view in the petition is uh, palpable. The points that councillors have made, you know this area, in fairness, much, much better than I do. You know, I, I take those very seriously. Um, I think the only constructive and the correct thing for me to say that I need to do is to reflect actually on what I've heard, to talk again to, to colleagues. And um, uh, uh, I'm not... I think it's more a question of what we do next rather than trying to rerun something that's happened. Um, but but I can take the point entirely that if we may have got a, uh, a, a a partial or perhaps even misleading sense of the impact it has on particular segments of the community by taking a picture in the round. So I, I think what I'd like to do is to talk some more to colleagues, talk to the practice, and think about um, what the art of the possible is here, because I, 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 I take very seriously the issues. I remain a little kind of um, uncertain, really, as to what in the real world, what our options actually are. But I think, um, you know, we have to take notice of the strength of feeling and the, and the points that have been made by by this petition and by the councillors who've spoken. Um, so, Chair, with your permission, I'd like to reflect on that and perhaps come back to you with with a suggestion about what we might do next rather than try and grasp at something now and and either get it wrong or make a promise that I can't deliver on. So it, it feels to me like I need to, to reflect and consider a little and then try and suggest a way forward. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that would be helpful. Um, okay, look, uh, thank you very much to uh, Bob for, for joining us uh, virtually. Thank you very much also for Amanda for putting the petition in. Uh, and also thank you uh, to Andy and uh, your colleagues uh, here in the room for um, taking the time to, to join us today. Um, and I think we'd very welcome uh, your offer to, to pause and, and think and uh, uh, mm. reflect on um, where, where we are at the moment and uh, taking on uh, Councillor Bray's uh, comments and Mr Bray's comments that um, uh, this is not going to be uncommon, I think, in the future uh, across the whole of the county. So uh, get, getting getting it right now uh, is going to be um, hopefully reducing the amount of pain and, and concern from uh, residents in the future. So thank you very much for that. OK, look, um, I'm going to move on to the next item, if that's OK, um, and then uh, we can move yes, on thank, to the, Can I say thank you, Chair, and thanks for uh, Andy's uh, commitment to think about it some more. Uh, and we look forward to whatever comes out of that. But thank you anyway, and I'll hang up so that um, not I'm not doing what I did last time, which was listen to the next debate and make facial expressions which affect the uh, decisions of the committee. Thank you. No, it's always lovely to look at you, but uh, I can quite understand <laughs> what I'm saying. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay. And and thank you very much also to uh, Sarah and also to Richard. So thank you for joining us. Um, so we now move on to item nine, which is uh, childhood uh, obesity. Uh, we've got uh, Kelly Marie Evans uh, on our uh, screens in front of us, uh, who's the uh, uh, consultant in public health here at County Hall. So uh, welcome very much to you, Kelly. If you can uh, briefly, we'll all have uh, read the report um, and uh, we'll take it as read. But if you could, um, if there's sort of a few points that you wish to uh, draw out over the next minute or two, uh, by all means, please do. And then we'll move on to questions uh, and discussion of the paper. So, uh, Kelly, over to you. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, so this is a report just to inform the committee of the current work that's going on with regards to addressing childhood overweight and obesity. Um, there is a plethora of national guidance that I've tried to um, include in the report, um, but I just want you to give you the assurance that we have included all of that within the healthy weight strategy. Um, and developed an action plan through that, um, which will be delivered through the Children Young People's um, Plan. Um, so in the report, in addition, um, I think we all know that obesity has an impact on reduced life expectancy, but also healthy life expectancy. So it is really important that we do something about it. I couldn't agree more. Um, and I've tried to pick out some of the data points of where we've recognised there might be areas for improvement. So with regards to breastfeeding, 
healthy start uptake and um, uh, children's consumption, uh, yeah, how much fruit and vegetables they eat. Um, so the data is all in there, happy to answer any questions on that. We are mandated through the public health grant to um, take children in reception and year six, uh, their heights and weights. So that's known as the National Treasured Measurement Programme. And again, the, the figures are in there. So um, it has, through COVID, actually reduced um, the numbers that are a healthy weight. They've even, they've either become more underweight children or more overweight children. Um, I guess what we don't know is whether that's just a blip due to COVID, but future years will be able to tell us whether there's a trend in that. Um, and the absolute numbers are in the report. So by the time children leave primary school, there's about 30% that are considered either overweight or obese, and that relates to 2,000 young people. Um, again, I won't necessarily go through all the service provision, but happy to answer any questions. We've got universal provision and then more targeted. Um, we try to cover not just weight management services, but also through the food plan, that wider role that food plays um, in um, health issues, and then obviously the link between poverty and obesity. Um, so, but then we do have weight management services to refer people into if needed. Um, I guess from what we're taking all of that information takeaways, um, so we're working with the district planning um, in how we embed health policies um, and health impact assessments through their supplementing planning guidance. Um, and yeah, I've just listed a few next steps. Um, so. COVID obviously has had an impact, but we're trying to understand the needs of children and young people through the lens of obesity and um, address some of those in the hope that it will be just a blip in sedentary behaviour and increased obesity rather than a trend. Um, we have, we understand from those children that are measured that they don't all then necessarily tip up into weight management services. So we're trying to get a better understanding of actually what or how we could support the families to reduce their weight if need be. And we're working really closely with Environment and Transport and um, Active Together to um, try and embed active travel plans through um, schools, through the County Council's Choose How You Move. Um, and again, on a similar vein, but more through the um, district councils, we're working with planning and environmental health um, to understand how we might use the regulations um, for fast food outlets, especially those that are uh, close to schools and early year settings, and how through environment and health we might be able to support food outlets to promote those healthier choices so that it's easier for um, people to access that rather than the healthy um, uh, more high fat high sugar foods um, and I guess we kind of captured this all under and it is in the um, whole systems approach to obesity that health and all policies approach so how can we um, within Leicestershire County Council but also partners really understand what the health impacts of the decisions that we are making have um, so we're in initial stages of that, but we've got some processes in place to understand the health impacts of the decisions we make and how we might maximise the positives um, and minimise those negatives. Um, so that was all I was going to bring out of the paper, Chair. Thank you very much, Kelly. That was a, a, a very good whistle stop uh, summary of uh, where we are. Thank you very much for that. Um, Ross, I think you've got a question, haven't you? I do indeed. Yeah, thank you for that, Chair. Um, this is obviously a difficult nut to crack because we're talking about fundamental behaviour change um, in young people um, and it's going to require frequent interventions, you know, using the make and every contact count uh, framework. One of the healthcare workers that these people will see more often than anyone else are dentists, um, you know, usually at least twice a year. And I was looking at the stats actually before this meeting and extractions are the number one reason for general anaesthetic admissions um, in under fives. And it's cost of £836 per tooth. Um, and obviously, these children aren't just having one tooth removed. You know, I've referred patients to have every single one of their teeth, deciduous teeth, taken out. Um, now, I discuss diet, and I'm sure most dentists will discuss diet every single time a patient comes into the surgery. You know, the frequency of the sugar they're having, the amount of sugar they're having. Um, but it's difficult because just last week I had a patient come in. Um, he was year eight, and he says he has an energy drink on his way to school every single day. And I can, you know, say well, that's probably not a great idea. And it goes in one ear and comes out the other. Um, what would be fantastic is if dentists had some sort of referral system similar, similar to kind of smoke and cessation um, referral systems. So we can kind of have more joined up thinking. The difficulty is that the obesity strategy um, only mentions oral health once in this report and it's in passing. 
Um, I mean, I'm biased in thinking that a dentist could be the ace at the sleeve uh, in this battle, but, you know, I'd appreciate to hear, Kelly, what your thoughts are on where dentists play, you know, could play a good role in the fight. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, and, yeah, I guess obesity has multiple impacts on health, doesn't it? And the teeth are one of maybe the ones that it shows in first. So, um, yeah, um, I'm more than happy to contact you outside of the meeting um, to look at how we might be able to share some of the information we currently have to make sure dentists have access to it. Um, we do, do also have within the public health team a oral health promotion delivery service. Um, they do work predominantly with early year settings, um, but can definitely um, make sure other wider um, uh, dentists have access to the information and um, happy to explore whether a referral system is something that's that's possible or even understanding if you have that relationship with the pet, uh, patients because you see them more kind of like getting a better understanding of why they have some of the health behaviours without it coming across potentially um, as challenging because it is re sometimes a difficult conversation to bring up so um, yeah the MEC approach would definitely be something we could we could build on. Louise, you've got your hand up. Yes, yeah, sorry. I was just going to come on as, you know, a really good point Ross has made. Um, and I think, you know, we should look at it. Um, I just want to, you know, say that we obviously are trying to uh, intervene and, and, you know, put prevention work in right from pregnancy onwards um, with a lot of our healthy eating promos and, and things for mothers um, before they actually, well, ladies before they actually become mothers and looking at the family um, situation as well. So by taking in the environment and the planning and um, all of the things Kelly said, we're trying to attack it from every area, every uh, direction. But I take Ross's point seriously. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Um, I've got a point from Amanda and then Craig. Thank you, Chair. Um, great, great on dentists. I completely agree. Um, my kids came home with their little from when they had their their, their dentist pack uh, in school, and they were, you know, they were chuffed to pieces, and it stopped being mum telling them what to do, and it became the dentist telling me what to do. So that's a really good idea. The the point, I suppose, is in the document. There's evidence linking breastfeeding with protection against weight later in childhood, and you know, colleagues who've been on this this panel for a little while, and I'm sure Mike would would, would go, oh, yeah. Um, we actually haven't been able to present the information for Leicestershire on breastfeeding rates since I've been here at Health Scrutiny. So I think it's really important that if this is a part of the key, which we know it is, that it's not just something that falls to public health, though, because actually if you look at the, the, the data, the timeline of when breastfeeding stops, the most common hours is 16 to 20 hours old. Old, which is obviously generally mum is mum is either still in the hospital or has been discharged from hospital and by themselves. So breastfeeding starts pre-birth in a sense that you need to get into the psychology of breastfeeding. But I think it'd be really useful for us to make sure we're counting it. However, the question really is about you know something we talked in the in the in the brief beforehand was about the healthy start data. Is you know if we look at there's 3,000 families we think are eligible, only 1,000 are getting what's available to them in terms of the Healthy Start vouchers. And I'd be really interested to know how that's connected together, um, particularly when we know that, you know, if you go and see a benefits advisor, they're going to chat to you about universal credit. They're not going to maybe speak about this. You go to your midwife, you're not going to take financial advice from your midwife. So it's it's where do you draw the line to make sure those 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 support mechanisms that families can access do get access. And I suppose finally, one of the things that we've had before, um, and it's something that's in the data, is about the physical active of um per hour per day of, a, of a, a young person at 15. And the data's quite old in here, but actually what we've seen in the history is actually there's a huge drop off for girls at 13 and the drop off for boys happens a bit later um, and I suppose if we could do something to address that drop off in physical activity those are the key ages where you know girls I would imagine when they start their period is the point at which that they they are dropping out of sport and for boys when they finish their school career which I think is probably the two key, two key dropout rates so I'll be really interested to understand what what 
what we're going to do on physical activity around those two age ranges. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, can I take the question from Craig and then perhaps maybe Kelly, you can come back on both of those. Sure. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's a little bit of a, an observation as well as a question as well. Um, obviously, we last couple of years we've been exposed to the, the whole pandemic and the effects that that's had. But when you look at this report, especially on paragraph five, uh, it's quite worrying when you read that paragraph. And you see that, you know, that it's massively on the rise. Uh, the these kids are going to face discrimination, stigmatization, increased risk of hospitalization, um, approximately 16 million days of sickness and absence. And obviously being on a healthy way can have an impact on employability, productivity, uh, local communities, and to increase uh, the welfare costs as well. That to me is at the same level as the pandemic that we've just come out of. And what's really concerning through the data that you've provided is that this is a year upon year uh, increase. Yes, we had the blip last year um, with, with the COVID report, but you know, if you go a little bit further back and dig back, uh, you'll see that it is, although it's only marginal, it is year on year increase. And again, that that is quite worrying when you consider that one in three, a third of all children leaving school are uh, clusters overweight or obese. But for me, the, the, the real issue, I believe, is the younger children. When a child, and this is through the, my work experience, when a child gets to 12, 13, 14, 15, they make the, their own choices, but they've also created habits, a lifelong habits as well, that are incredibly difficult um, to, to, to break. And we talk about exercises as the, the, you know, the key to all the, the uh, cure perhaps to obesity but in my opinion it's not it's creating these healthy habits really on early in life particularly for the the one to three year olds um because obviously we know from previous reports that we see that uh, you know younger and younger children are becoming obese and and uh, overweight as well but these children don't necessarily make healthier choices it's the parents and carers that make these choices for them and I think that we, we need to look at the, this report, look at the, uh, the great work that you're doing. Obviously, Kelly, you spent some time with you yesterday talking about the great work. And I do uh, you know, congratulate you on, on the uh, steps that you are making. But the, the, the problem is we've got to get into these parents' minds of what they're... Um, I couldn't agree more with most of it. So from the breastfeeding perspective, um, yeah, there was a data quality issue, but I believe now we should have the data. So we're still similar from a Leicestershire perspective um, for breastfeeding initiation. Um, so obviously that's relative um so there is some definitely some work to do there and especially around we do have a peer support network um led by lpt through our healthy child um provision um but you're you're right women either don't start uh, don't um consider starting in the first place i think we need to understand some of those culturally ingrained reasons why women don't start breastfeeding and then yeah the dropout rate is often um as soon as they're discharged from hospital so we could definitely improve the support that they're given um, in that initial period. Um, healthy start, um, I can't remember the exact question, but I agree. So we are working probably, maybe not necessarily on purpose, but through the um, routes that we have easy access to that we know are seeing the women we um, want to reach. So we are predominantly working through the Nautch 19 service and through the midwives, but I agree they're not necessarily the people you'd go through to uh, manage your finances. So if there is any opportunity to um, work with those uh, who are giving debt advice, then I'm more than happy to pick up um, how best to enable that to happen. Uh, most of the, the information is, is online um, now. Um, but again, I, if I have can get get some contacts and I'll, I'll make um, contact with them out of the meeting. Uh, we do have some information that goes out to the food banks, but again, I have to take your point. They're not necessarily where you'd go for financial advice. So I will follow up to find out who the best people are from uh, who give debt advice and how we ensure healthy start information is there. Um, with regards to physical activity data, yeah, I'd need to follow up with what we're particularly doing. Um, I know. Um, active together are looking at ensuring there's a broad range of physical activity that's available as yeah as trends and people change from that potentially not necessarily um, for sport but that sort of like more group uh, routine um, opportunities to get 
t- take part in school sport, why potentially those then don't continue, um, especially like you say, it is for girls earlier than than boys. Um, so I would need to get back um, to you to see what actual programmes um, Active Together are doing, because I don't, sorry, know off the top of my head. Um, and if they're not doing anything, obviously I can speak to them about what might be possible. And then Councillor Smith, um, your comments. Um, yeah, it would be great to have a better understanding, I guess, of where we could reach the parents. Uh, again, we are cu- kind of working through our levers with regards to commissioning, um, obviously through the Nortra 19 contract, uh, working with the Nortra 2 pathway and the children and families wellbeing uh, advisors. But there's definitely more opportunities to consider that wider stakeholder. Um, and I know that you volunteered to be the um, a healthy weight uh, member champion. So I'm happy to pick up with you maybe outside about how we reach some of those wider community groups um, that obviously have contact with the parents um, and what information and advice we might be able to give to them to pass on to the parent who has that relationship with the parent rather than necessarily coming from someone sat in public health with no relationship um, with that that family. Um, so has that covered everything or would you like me to expand on any of those? I think you've probably covered everything actually. I can, I can see nods, so that's good. Uh, are there any other points that anyone wishes to raise? No, I can't see any other points. Look, uh, thank you very much, Kelly. I don't know, uh, Louise, you've just put your hand up. Do you, I was just going to ask you whether you want to conclude on this one. Yes, I just wanted to come back and say that it's a, a real difficulty in, you know, engagement um, when people are, you know, just starting out on family life, et cetera, and trying to get those changes in habits. It's very much about not trying to dictate to people, but trying to encourage them along. And and so that's the, the tact we really have to take, um, you know, and, and yes, there are room for improvement, but we are doing, um, you know, there's a lot of work going on that's um, really beneficial at the moment. And we just need to build on that. Thanks. OK, thank you very much for that. Um, OK, look, thank you very much. Uh, that concludes uh, that item, and uh, I think probably an ongoing one uh, by um, by the sounds of it. Um, plenty to track over the coming months and years, um, particularly on some of the, the the longer term trends in relation. You talked about um, sort of the COVID blip, etc. Um, uh, you know, it, as with so much that we we've discussed in relation to the last couple of years, yeah, there are opportunities that have come out um, of, of doing things differently and and reacting to to um, uh, things differently and and this may well be one of those things that um, ho- hopefully gives us an advantage rather than actually disadvantage but um, it depends I guess on on how we actually um, tackle some of the the data that comes out so uh, thank you very much for that Kelly. Right we're now moving on again sticking with Kelly we're now moving on to item 10 which is the public health grant update um, which uh, we didn't actually know what the figure was uh, when it came to the MTFS at the last meeting uh, because the grant uh, level itself hadn't then been published. Uh, it has now been published for the 2022-23 figure. Now, uh, Kelly, I know you have the figure. Uh, if you can let us know what it is, uh, and particularly, I think probably um, whether it differs from what we had assumed and therefore was in the MTFS. I think if it's the figure that we assumed in the MTFS, then it is what it is. Um, but actually, if it's different to that, then uh, obviously of interest. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thanks, Chair. So, yeah, we've been allocated 26.2 million for 22-23. Um, and they took into consideration um, inflation at the time. So there's been that's an increase of 2.1%. Um, so there is an increase in in um, the grant for the next three years um, and but not maybe in line with the rest of inflation so um, it we hadn't um, made any plans to necessarily increase our spending levels so it is still um, in line with the MTFS so um, yeah okay thank you very much uh, Louise is there anything you actually want to add to that one no, I think it's positive that we've, uh, you know, been able to hold the, um, you know, we've been allocated a uh, similar figure to uh, before, but um, we'll just have to see how it um, 
works through. We also obviously look after Rutland as well. So we have another 1.3 million, I think, for Rutland. Is that right, Kelly? Yeah, I think so. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think this is probably just a, a piece for information. I don't think probably there are any questions, I guess, unless anyone desperately wants to ask any. But look, th thanks a lot for l updating us. Uh, so we now move on to item 11, uh, which is the restoration and recovery of elective planned care in Leicester, Leicestershire and Rutland. So uh, we have helping us with the report, Helen Hendley, who's the uh, uh, planned care director, at UHL, and also Paula Vaughan. Welcome back, Paula, uh, is Deputy Chief Operating Officer at UHL. Uh, both of you are online. I can both see you, so that's great. Uh, so again, uh, as usual, we'll take the report as read. Um, it, it's it's a very interesting report. Lots of lots of uh, information in there. I'm sure there's going to be quite a few questions coming out of that. But um, can I uh, give you the opportunity, the next sort of 60 seconds, as it were, to if there are any additional points that you want to tease out or anything that you want to direct us to uh, that possibly have an update on uh, in relation to the report, then please do. Thank you, Chair, uh, and, and hello, colleagues. Uh, as Chair said, I'm Helen Henley, new Director of Planned Care, actually for the LLR system, and it's my fifth week in post, um, so I'm really looking forward to working with you, and I've, I've really enjoyed hearing the previous conversations. Um, just two or three key points, really, if I may, Chair. Um, the first really is to, to draw, you, draw your attention to the conclusion, which for me really does encapsulate the position for, for UHL and LLR, and that is that providing excellent quality of care is paramount to us all. Um, we do have to prioritise planned care alongside emergency care and, and clearly there is more for us to do to reduce the time that patients are waiting and that's why my role's now in post uh, that's to bring together those system plans to ensure that happens um, the second point I really just wanted to draw everyone's attention to is recognition actually for the impact that COVID has had on our patients and our staff over the last two years increased infection prevention and control measures as, as we all know uh, staff redeployment to maintain sufficient intensive care capacity has resulted in significant reductions in our our theatre and elective and cancer care capacity. Um, we do have patients waiting over two years as referenced in the report for routine surgery and we are working as a, it is a priority uh, and we're working with clinical teams and system partners to reduce that as quickly as possible. Um, we have got additional capacity on site at the Glenfield in the form of Vanguard Theatres which I understand some, some colleagues may be able to visit next Tuesday. Uh, um, and my third and last point really centres on cancer care, which again uh, referenced in the in the document. We do have patients waiting longer than we would want for diagnostics or for ruling out of, of their cancer or treatment. And again, that's due to a mix of factors, including staffing, increased referral rates uh, and the impact that COVID has had on our on our capacity. Just some key actions that I wanted to, um, to draw out. We are strengthening our governance at UHL. John's actually interviewing today for a key role, hence um, why he's not here. There will be a deep dive into specific tumour sites and a greater granularity uh, on the actions being taken, but more importantly, the impact um, they will have. I'll pause there for any comments or questions, uh, and again, we'll draw on Paula. Um, cancer care is, I think, probably up a gastro and also was a dermo as well that, that, that talked about, you know, having now actually got back on top of uh, their their cases. Um, can, I, can I ask, in relation to some of the others that probably are not listed, um, how, how, where are they in relation to that? Because actually, you know, if, if two, two of the teams have, have effectively caught up and, and are now on top of, um, that bodes well for possibly what's achievable elsewhere, but um, a bit of commentary about that would be helpful. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to take that and would welcome Paula, Paula joining in that conversation as well. I think there are two other tumour sites that I would say um, are, are troubled at the moment, one being breast uh, and the volume of referrals that we've seen go through through that tumour site, but then also the capacity constraints that we've had. Um, now, there are, I think, from memory, about six or seven actions that are already in train, which involve things like breast pain pathway, additional capacity, you know, all, all the usual sort of uh, schemes that we would want to to ensure are happening within within the system. Um, so breast, absolutely, I've seen a plan for. ENT, we, we've got a plan for as well. But I think it, it's in the context of everything else that's going on as well um, across the organisation and just being able to prioritise those emergency cancer and a, a significant amount of long wait patients that the ENT currently have. Um, so I'll draw on Paula there if there's anything else to, to bring in. But they were certainly the two tumour sites that that worried me more so in terms of the volume of patients that, that we've got and the performance that we're seeing around that around that pathway. Paula? 
Thanks, Helen. I just want to give the committee the specifics around those two, really, just so you can get a real grip of, of how we're doing. So at the point of writing the paper, as you can see, we've got a, a real um, uh, an acceleration of the actions that mean that we're back to where we want to be. For breast specifically, there are some key actions. Um, I won't go through the detail, but just to give you the example of how quickly and how significant those actions are. Um, we've managed to treat an additional 900 patients over the last few weeks off that backlog and we'll be back to a two-week wait position of the 99% that we should be at by the end of March. That's only three or four weeks away. We currently got a four-week wait. We will be back to the two-week wait. So that's the speed at which we're managing now to turn these things back around. Um, but they are very specific actions and every tumour site is different. So for breast is about capacity. The pathway isn't technically difficult, but it's it's around the volume we can get through. For ENT, there's an opportunity actually to completely transform the pathway. So where historically you might have been seen in clinic within two week waits and then referred for um, a diagnostic in an out in a, a more technical outpatient or theatre based session, we can now do that with new equipment in the outpatient session at the first appointment. So not only are we also trying to work through the backlog, we're also transforming the pathway so it's better as well. So they're they're very different actions. For each tumour site, but they're very, uh, they are they're definitely the right ones to do. So we're looking at transforming as well as working through the backlog. Okay, thanks a lot. That's um, very interesting. In particular, the the sort of new ways of working um, approach, because we've heard that several times um, earlier on today uh, about you know it's not about just recovery; it's actually about learning uh, new new ways of approaching. Uh, what, what's been done traditionally uh, before, but um, adapting and changing completely. Okay, are there any other questions, Amanda? Just a, just a really quick one, actually, um, on screening and whether screening is back to where you want it to be. So obviously, your routine uh, smears, routine um, breast screening, the pre the preventative checks that are done through the GP. Are you are you happy that's where it needs to be to ensure that early diagnosis is as 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 you know, it's crucial is, you know, are you happy it's back where it needs to be? Thank you. I'll ask Paula to answer on that one. No problem. Um, we talked about this briefly last time. And in fact, it might be interesting for the committee if maybe we work with public health and bring something joint back um, to go through some of the the, the more high profile tumour sites in detail. Um, just to give you some reassurance there about the screening programmes. Um, they are in the main back to where they were pre-COVID, but of course then there is a backlog involved in that as well. So um, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, there are some screening programmes that are currently in the process of being either recommissioned or um, we're thinking about how do we incorporate them back into UHL, for example, the bowel screening as well, to make sure that we get enough capacity to make sure that people don't wait. And when we're sending an invite, we're able to get them in in the right time period as well. So there is some significant work going on around um, screening capacity. Um, I would suggest, though, in something a little bit more specific and a bit more transparent, that we bring something back joint and public health colleagues in, in a month or, or at your next committee, we could commit to doing that. OK, that would certainly be useful, I think. Be very, very useful. Um, okay, that's helpful. Are there any other further questions? Uh, Ross. Thanks, Chair. Um, I think it's great that we've got a plan in place now to kind of restore services for patients. Um, and as I'm looking at the different ideas that we've got in the report, things like, um, you know, these new Vanguard theatres, uh, commissioning diag new diagnostic centres, uh, use of independent sector organisations, um, that's going to place a, a strain, I presume, on the support services and the kind of non-clinical admin team. Um, the reason I'm asking this question is because I've had uh, a family friend who, uh, several times I've gone for an operation, they've turned up on the day and it's been cancelled um, for, and she wasn't told in advance. Um, I appreciate it's a very difficult time, but how um, well would you say the non-clinical staff are working right now and um, with all these new services opening up? So happy, happy to take that. But then Paula, again, can add some more context. I think you raise a very good point around um, the amount of admin and support required to deliver these pathways. And I think perhaps historically, um, you know, uh, organisations have been quick to put a solution in, but then not think about the support that's actually required to, to deliver that activity. And I think Paula in particular, in the five weeks that I've been in, in post, has been uh, fundamental to actually making sure that, that does happen and to make sure that our teams are well looked after in uh, in what is essentially a, a very busy time. There will be mistakes and, and, and obviously we apologise for for the position that, that, that you've, you've found, uh, your friend found themselves in. Um, 
it does happen and given the volume of patients that we've got coming through you know uh, that there will be a margin of error in there but I think on the whole we fully recognize that actually the the support teams play a very significant part in this and it is a rather stressful part of it actually as well because they are on the end of you know unhappy patients the the sort of the news that people don't want to hear around cancelling an operation it's very difficult but we are supporting teams uh, as best we can actually to make sure that 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 then doesn't sort of affect them from doing their work going forward. But Paula, happy for you to add some, some context to that. Thank you, Helen, and thank you, Council, for your comments. And firstly, extend again our apologies to your um, family friends um, for their um, experience. It's obviously not the experience you want anybody to, to have. Um, Helen has obviously explained quite a lot about why it happens. Um, just to give you a bit of reassurance as to my personal commitment to this that Helen alluded to, I am a medical secretary and a waiting list administrator by background, and I'm very passionate about this group of staff, and I recognise fully the amount of skill and effort and commitment they personally make as, as much as clinical staff just in their different way to the patient pathway and journey um, and absolutely as we put together all our plans particularly for next year and around the amount of clinical work we have to do we have got an absolute proportional response for the administrative staff not only investment into people and numbers but also their training their development their support acknowledging the fact their jobs have got more complex we absolutely have to do that too thank you Thank you very much. Actually, I, I just uh, reminded actually of um, from from Ross's point, which um, is also about the sort of communication side. I know obviously text messaging is is uh, a, a huge advance as far as reminding people of appointments. Um, my only plea would be to actually just add a little bit more information to some of the text. So uh, I'll give you an example of an uh, el elderly relative who um, uh, her husband also uh, likewise um, various conditions. Uh, she receives the text messages for on behalf of both of them uh, at sort of six o'clock on a Friday, received a text message confirming an appointment at LRI uh, for nine o'clock on Monday morning. Didn't say for who, didn't say what condition, didn't even say which clinic. It just said, we're confirming your nine o'clock appointment on Monday morning. Um, it took us quite a while to, to phone around LRI switchboards over the, the weekend to actually work out which of them it belonged to, uh, where the clinic was, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So just a little bit more information would help because the text. I have to say the text service is great, and I know from your perspective, it's made a huge improvement on uh, patients uh, attending. Um, but uh, where you're dealing with individuals who are maybe the the sole recipient for for more than one patient, and where they have multiple conditions uh, uh, in concurrently um, being treated, uh, a bit more information makes a huge difference. So, Paul, you've got your hand up. Thank you. It was only to add to that, absolutely, because, of course, with an increasing backlog as well, more and more patients are on the waiting list for more than one thing. Um, so, therefore, we need to really think about, again, transforming that communication mechanism and how it works. Um, and we are absolutely in the middle of doing that in terms of looking at not just how we communicate around appointments and, and um, reminding people and supporting them to come into the right place, but also how we keep that dialogue, dialogue going in a way that works for people and adds value to them while they're waiting as well. That's that's also not an easy thing to get right, um, but it's really important to us that we do. Okay, thank you very much. My, my only other addition is actually, I, I, you know, in many cases, uh, huge congratulations to, to your teams being creative about uh, dealing with with some of the backlogs, um, uh, you know, I, I've had people report back where uh, actually the NHS uh, has come through quicker sometimes than than private sector on on delivering quite significant operations. So it's so a well done. So thank you very much for that. So uh, any further questions, or are we out of questions? I think we're probably out of questions. So look, uh, thank you very much, Helen. Uh, hopefully the first five weeks have been good. Uh, welcome to. Uh, the wider community uh, and thank you very much Paula also for for joining us again so um we are uh, on to uh, item 11 uh, or rather we've completed item 11 now on to item 12 which is the date of the next meeting the date of the next meeting is the 15th of June